um, the way we're going to have this, we're just going to let a couple of few people just sneak in here for a little bit. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to the final event of this week's series of lectures. Uh, my name is Austin Hoff. I'm a political science, global studies, and Chinese student here at Concordia. Um, and I just want to thank you all for taking the time to attend the student panel. Our question today is whether a nuclear-free world is feasible and or desirable. Um, sort of my job today is to introduce you to the panelists and speakers that we're going to be hearing from this morning. Our featured guest who will provide a response to the arguments of our student <coughs> panelists is Francesco Colasaro. Francesco Collagero is an emeritus professor at the physics department of the University of Rome, La Sapienza. His current research in mathematical and theoretical physics is focused on isochronous systems and related mathematical results. Francesco Collagero has published over 380 papers and four books on scientific topics. His exploration of science and society issues related to arms control and disarmament has resulted in over 440 papers and two books. Francesco Collagero co-edited with M. Goldberger and S. Kapitza a multi-authored monograph on verification for the purpose of monitoring disarmament, published in English in the United States and in Russian in the Soviet Union. Each chapter of the book was divided, or sorry, each chapter of the book was co-authored by eminent scientists and politicians on both sides of the Cold War divide. It was the first book on such a sensitive topic to have this feature. From 1982 to 1992, Francesco Collagero was a member of the governing board of the Stockholm International Peace <coughs> Research Institute. From 1989 to 1997, he served as Secretary General of the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. And in that capacity, he accepted, on behalf of Pugwash, the 1995 Nobel Peace Prize awarded to Joseph Rotblat and to Pugwash for their efforts to diminish the part played by nuclear arms in international politics and in the longer run to eliminate such arms. From 1997 to 2002, he served as chairman of the Pugwash Council, of which he is now an ex officio member. I'd like to expand, extend a special thank you to Dr. Collagio to, for participating in this event. And now for our student panelists. They are Sean Plemons, a political science and global studies double major, Paula Hader, majoring in global studies and Spanish, Devin Bowdry, majoring in political science and global studies, Emma Cannell, a political science and philosophy double major, and Taylor Tielke, majoring in political science and global studies. Our moderator is Siri Manning, a political science major with a history minor. Thanks also to the other members of Dr. Moore's international security class who helped prepare today's arguments. So the format this morning will be a little bit like this. Uh, after Sean provides us with an introduction, Paula and Devin will argue for the desirability and feasibility of a nuclear-free world, followed by Emma and Taylor, who will argue against this motion. Each panelist will have five minutes to make their remarks. Then, Dr. Collagero will provide a 10-minute response. Finally, we'll open it up for discussion, moderated by Siri. So with that said, I'll turn things over to Sean to get started. President Barack Obama said during a 2009 speech in Prague that he wanted to commit the United States to a nuclear-free world. He said, today I state clearly and with conviction America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. This goal will not be reached quickly, perhaps not in my lifetime. It will take patience and persistence, but now we too must ignore the voices that tell us that the world cannot change. Obama, along with many other prominent figures, have stated that a nuclear-free world is truly possible, but many who have experienced nuclear deterrence as a success would beg to differ. To make an argument for either side, we must first find out what nuclear weapon deterrence is. Deterrence is a strategy intended to prevent an opponent from undertaking an action that they have not yet started. This theory can be applied to not only conventional weapons, but also armies, but now we can apply it to nuclear weapons. Nuclear deterrence first gained prominence during the Cold War. 
the United States and Soviet Union both possess nuclear weapons, and to prevent each other from attacking one another, they threatened that the possibility of a nuclear attack would result in absolute annihilation of the other state. So basically, if there was a nuclear attack against the United States from the Soviet Union, or vice versa, the United States possessed the capability to send a counterattack. This can also be called uh, second strike capability, which means that no matter who strikes first, the other state will always be able to send a counterattack. Each state would ultimately be left destroyed. This principle is called mutual assured destruction. Either way you look at it, both the US and Soviet Union would be destroyed in a nuclear attack no matter who fired the first missile. Of course, deterrence hinges on a state's ability to actually back up this threat. They must actually possess the ability and resources to attack and send a counterattack. This is how deterrence worked during the Cold War. The threat of a counterattack would result in too high a cost of life, and therefore nuclear weapons would be kept in check. The stability of in the nuclear free world stemmed from this practice. It was the main way to prevent states during the Cold War from unpronounced attacks and to maintain relative peace. During the Cold War, there was also a treaty signed called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, it was a Cold War attempt to stop the spread of nuclear weapons throughout the world. It was opened for signature in 1968 and enforced in 1970. Five states are recognized as nuclear powers, the United States, Russia, United Kingdom, France, and China. They're also the five permanent members on the UN Security Council. States such as India and Pakistan have not signed the treaty, and North Korea uh, signed it but never complied, and they officially backed out in 2003. But those attempts was then and this is now. The Cold War ended over 20 years ago. There are no longer just two superpowers that hold most of the world's nuclear weapons. Many states now have nuclear weapons and are developing nuclear programs. In addition, there is the threat that various non-state actors such as terrorists who want to be in possession of a nuclear weapon would want to use it. Many prominent, well-respected foreign policy Cold War leaders have signed their uh, reverse their pro-nuclear ideals. In January of 2007, Henry Kissinger, Bill Perry, George Shultz, and Sam Nunn wrote in the Wall Street Journal in an op-ed piece that nuclear weapons no longer keep the world free and safe, and they are a source of extreme risk. But this is, an, is a nuclear-free world really possible? Can something that has been a source of such great power to states since the end of World War II be so easily thrown away? Can uh, we also rely on states that are v developing nuclear programs or various non-state actors to be rational in their actions? The very topic that we are trying to address today is whether or not nuclear weapons are needed or desirable in today's world. We will first hear arguments in favor of a nuclear free world from Paul and Devin. Um, following these, Emma and Taylor will give arguments that a nuclear free world cannot exist or is even desirable. And with that, we move on to our first argument. The threat of an actual nuclear attack is greater today than it ever has been, and for various reasons. And this means that the world free of nuclear weapons is all the more desirable. There are three points supporting the rationale of why a nuclear free world is not only desirable but necessary, given today's realities. And the first is nuclear proliferation, the spread of nuclear weapons to states that nor that previously hadn't possessed them, is a destabilizing issue and a very real threat to the world of nuclear politics. Nuclear threats no longer solely come from traditional Cold War powers, the USA and Russia, or the Soviet Union, like Sean had previously mentioned, because of said proliferation, and thus the situation has become more complicated and dangerous. The reality today is that we have rogue states, such as North Korea, who are more likely to actually use nuclear arms or sell nuclear arms technology, and we can't guarantee them being reasonable in their decision making. Iran also possess, uh, pos uh, poses a real threat if it does develop nuclear weapons program of increasing insecurity in the Middle East and causing other states to do the same. Saudi Arabia has already pledged to seek nuclear armament if Iran does develop such we weapons. And this is an example of how nuclear proliferation causes more pro proliferation. We also have weak states such as Pakistan who pose a threat in the sense that if 
the government was to collapse, terrorist factions within the country could easily gain control of their nuclear arsenals. This leads to the most pressing and unacceptable outcome of this situation, and that would be the possibility of a terrorist group gaining control of nuclear arms. Nu uh, terrorist groups cannot be deterred in the traditional sense that states can, if they can be deterred at all. In other words, if a terrorist organization was to obtain nuclear weapons, they would almost surely use them, and all hopes of preventing such an event with deterrence would be lost. The second point that I have built up to is that nuclear arms are a source of insecurity rather than the source of security that they were previously thought to be during the Cold War era. This is because traditional nuclear deterrence is no longer a stable option. We no longer live in a bipolar system of nuclear power where there were only two sides to deter in the game. More, actions, more actors mean more room for miscalculation. Also, deterrence largely relies on all parties involved being rational actors and seeing mutual assured destruction as unacceptable. Mutual assured destruction cannot be assumed as a viable deterrent for all nuclear actors today. And terrorist organizations do not have territory to threaten. If they did, a threat of destruction, retaliation, and death may even be an acceptable consequence as long as they accomplish their goals. And this point, the last point behind why um, nuclear, a nuclear weapon-free world is definitely desirable is the fact that nuclear weapons themselves and the threat of a nuclear war is far more terrible of a risk to accept as a possible reality. Um, nuclear arms technology can be seen as the most terrible thing that mankind has ever created because of the indiscriminate carnage and complete destruction that just one nuclear arm can cause. That, that's unlike any other weapon made in history. Such power to harm should never be utilized and certainly should never be allowed into the hands of those who would not hesitate to use it. Today we have a choice between seeking a nuclear-free world and living in a world that is insecure and heavily armed with nuclear weapons. Choosing the second option would be the same as accepting an eventual nuclear attack by either a state or non-state actor. It would be calling the high risk of nuclear war an acceptable reality. A free a world free of nuclear weapons is desirable and necessary because the possibility of such devastation cannot be one we are willing to risk. Okay, so working towards a nuclear free world in itself is already better than leaving the world as it is today. We have more standoffs to monitor now than we did before back in the Cold War. So with a nuclear free world, there's three things we have to ask ourselves. We have to ask ourselves, is it feasible to achieve uh, we need a plan to get there, and once we actually hit a nuclear-free world, how do we maintain the system at that point? So as far as feasibility goes, we've already seen a nuclear-free world happening. Uh, Russia and the United States have signed treaties to limit or to decrease their nuclear arms, and we tend to think that a state would never want to give up nuclear arms once it had it, but we've already seen two cases so far. Uh, South Africa possessed six nuclear arms, or nuclear weapons, excuse me, back in 1994, but they have since dismantled all of them. And Libya, or excuse me, Libya in 2003 uh, gave up their nuclear arms pose possessions, and that was spurred by some sanctions that they wanted to lift in the U.S. And then also we have non-nuclear arms states, but have the ability to achieve those weapons, such as Sweden. And all the other states around the world that are not seeking nuclear arms. We have to ask ourselves, what are the reasons for that? So then, a plan to achieve a nuclear-free world from where we are now. The biggest thing to understand is that this is not an overnight process. We are not talking one year, two years, five years, ten years even. We are thinking 30, 40, 50 years into the future. And as we slowly move towards this nuclear-free world, and as we disarm slowly, we increase the confidence and trust between states. And that in itself is enough to reduce the desire for nuclear arms. And the second thing is, related to nuclear arms disarmament, is resolving underlying problems. So basically taking away reasons as to why states would want to, desire, want to possess nuclear arms. Um, the big conflicts right now with nuclear arms are between uh, Pakistan and India, for example. If we work to resolve those conflicts, then what reason would they have to possess nuclear arms? As well as Israel and its Arab neighbors. Why, why would Israel desire a nuclear weapon if they didn't have to worry about its neighbors? 
which is easier said than done, of course, but it is something to work towards. And then treaties also. Uh, Sean had mentioned the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, that actually contains 189 members, and he had mentioned that India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel have not signed on to that. All four of them possess nuclear weapons, or are believed to at least. And then one of the arguments against the Non-Proliferation Treaty is that it, it really doesn't have consequences. And I believe the only real thing is you have to give a three months notice if you're going to back out. So we need to find a way to tighten or, or impose some sort of consequences on states that do not comply with the checks um, going along with that treaty there. And then also, we need to push the idea of a uh, nuclear free world through international institutions such as the United Nations. Um, it seems more legitimate than if the US were to come out and say, we need a nuclear free world. Well, we have plenty of nuclear weapons still. So it would seem more legitimate if that came from the UN or a large governing body throughout the world. So assuming we have hit this nuclear free state, we need to figure out how to maintain that status quo. And it's impossible to de-invent nuclear weapons. We have them, we have the technology, we can't get rid of that. So we need to monitor the, the substances used to produce nuclear weapons. Uranium is the big one. And we need to make sure that no state is using or enriching uranium to the weapons grade level, as there is a difference between nuclear energy for electricity means and for weapons means. And then as far as trying to figure out if anybody is cheating or essentially building up a new nuclear weapon in this new world, we have better intelligence collection today than we had before. And then a system of reverse deterrence could also be imposed. So essentially, we have a nuclear free world. And if one state decided to start building up a nuclear arsenal again, that would raise a red flag and generate a response from the entire world. So we have the feasibility is there, the plan is there, and the maintenance is there. And we need to start moving towards that now. In 1945, the scientists involved in the Manhattan Project test ran their new invention by detonating an atomic bomb at a testing facility in southern New Mexico. With that explosion, we fell off the cliff and into the nuclear age, and we're not going back. The creation of the atomic bomb has forever changed the landscape of international security. Those thoughts can't be unthought, those plans can't be unwritten, and we are not going back to being a world without nuclear weapons. The international system is one in which distrust ultimately rules. States cannot rely on an international police force to make sure that other states do what they ought. Because of this, states must primarily look out for themselves. In the nuclear age, this results in nuclear proliferation. It is clearly in the interest of a state to have the capabilities to strike back with excessive force. A fear of this excessive force being used in retaliation keeps states from attacking in the first place. Nuclear weapons provide the greatest deterrence, so it is difficult to convince a state to give up their own nuclear capabilities. Seemingly despite this, many world leaders have pledged themselves to a nuclear-free world, with President Obama calling for global zero as of late. He believes that the United States can be a world leader in arms reduction. The logic, apparently, is that America's reduction of arms will lead the rest of the world to follow its lead. Let us not fall victim to this faulty logic. The idea that other states will look to the United States as a model for their own actions has not been borne out in historical precedent, and we have no compelling reason to think that the situation will change. While we have seen many global leaders putting support behind the notion of global zero, these are political moves and cannot be counted on to be more than lip service. It's a politically savvy move, both for international and domestic audiences, to say you're in pursuit of a nuclear-free world. It's another thing entirely to sacrifice your nuclear arms to a point where you do not have second strike capabilities. We would need unanimous consent by major leaders to get to global zero. But this consent would have to go farther than a mere pledge, and we would have to see major world leaders, such as Russia and China, willingly revoke their second strike capabilities. What empirical evidence do we have to support the notion that the global community can come together on such a heated issue? 
Treats, treaties such as the SALTs, the STARTs, and of course the Non-Proliferation Treaty have made great gains in reducing the total number of nuclear weapons in the world, but those treaties are vague and do not have effective enforcement methods. We have seen troubling indications that states can and do directly go against their word in regards to these treaties. Despite Iran signing the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968, in 2012, then-President Ahmadinejad said, quote, if Iran wants to build an atomic weapon, it doesn't fear anyone and will publicly announce it and no one will be able to prevent it. A less than encouraging note from Iran, to say the least. Will states really abide by agreements, even if agreements can be written in the first place? It would be incredibly easy for states to cheat and create nuclear weapons just in case. The intelligence and the resources are readily available to states looking to pursue this technology, and states' distrust in others would easily lead to states believing others had already cheated, incentivizing their own creation of nuclear weapons. Our globalized world only makes it more likely that states will pursue or maintain their nuclear weapon capabilities. Increased information and resource sharing makes them easier to create, and frequent regional and intrastate conflicts provide incentives for states and non-state actors to achieve nuclear capabilities and maintain them. Global zero is not feasible. We are not able to rewind the tape to get to a time before nuclear weapons. The intelligence is there, the weapons are there, the incentives are there. We're stuck with these nuclear weapons. Now it's up to us to manage them safely and ethically. Okay, is, uh, is that good? Good, I don't know. So there are four reasons why a nuclear free world is not desirable. The first being that nuclear weapons are a source of peace and have been a factor creating peace since World War II. And there are two sub points to this. The first being is that <clears throat> excuse me, nuclear weapons have created a shift in the war calculus. Before the advent of nuclear weapons, states would use war as a political factor, a um, something that they could gain from, and they would view war as something as they could either win or lose, and whether they would win or lose, it's what they would win or gain. With the advent of nuclear weapons, it's not a question of whether or not you'll gain from a war, but whether or not you'll survive. So the advent of nuclear weapons created a shift in the war calculus, which makes war something that nobody wants, and nothing can be gained from a war in which you could potentially be destroyed. Um, the second sum part to this is that nuclear weapons balance the system. If we look today, uh, countries like the United States, Britain, France, Russia, uh, are the most powerful states in the system, and with nuclear weapons, that solidifies and insulates their power. And if we were to remove that, that would allow other states to challenge them with conventional weapons now that they cannot use their nuclear arsenals, which um, makes them more powerful. And we see that this creates groundwork for greater conflict. But, they're all the, but there's also other states, if we look to instances like South Korea and Japan, who could easily go nuclear but rely on states like the United States to use their nuclear weapons to deter other nuclear states like North Korea. So inevitably, if we were to remove nuclear weapons, what would happen is states that traditionally receive security umbrellas, so protection from other nuclear states, would go nuclear to check back states that would never give up and have yet to give up their nuclear weapon programs like North Korea or uh, Iran. The second point is that nuclear weapons create incentives for peace and cooperation. Uh, one can obviously look to the Cold War, how the United States and the Soviet Union had a direct line between uh, their heads of states because the war was too costly. If they were to engage in a fight, both would be destroyed, so there's nothing to gain. Uh, even today, we can see how war has become obsolete because of nuclear weapons. There's nothing, nothing possible that states can gain from fighting each other. So the fact that uh, nuclear weapons pose such a dangerous uh, force to states and to their survival. It creates an incentive for states to work towards peace. The other part of this is that nukes provide a vital diplomatic check on other states to uphold their treaty obligations. So if we look at rogue or what some people would call irrational states like Iran or North Korea, who would you know, defy international norms or defy international law, if states were to give up their nuclear arsenals, that gives up a diplomatic trump card that we can use against these states. So if we were to give up our nuclear weapons, there'd be nothing that uh, states like the United States or you know, Japan or South Korea would have to check against uh, aggression or treaty violations by states like Iran or North Korea. Third is that nuclear weapons promote cheating so Emma kind of talked about this. If we were to work towards a global zero or a uh, 
world in which, in which all states gave up their nuclear weapons, it creates a scenario in which there's incentives for states to keep their nuclear programs running secretly or to maintain a secret arsenal of nuclear weapons. So when all the other states give up their nuclear weapons, they then are the predominant power and can use and project their power through those nuclear weapons. And inevitably what we'd see is that once all the other states are working towards getting rid of their nuclear weapons and there's a scare that one state is building up nuclear weapons or keeping their nuclear weapons, uh, this would cause rapid proliferation. So what we'd see is that a second Cold War would happen, but in this case, it would be dozens upon dozens of states working towards nuclear weapons, and that's a worse security scenario to be in than you know, today where we have uh, states who have had nuclear weapons for a long time and know how to use them, uh, how to use them ethically. So really, removing and trying to remove nuclear weapons creates uh, greater risks of proliferation uh, than the status quo. And lastly, what we have to see is that removing weapons only increases the chances that non-state actors like terrorists or uh, undesirable states that want to acquire nuclear weapons will actually get nuclear weapons. So uh, right now, states who have nuclear weapons like the United States, uh, Russia, China, uh, France, Great Britain, have their nuclear te technology and their weapons in secured arsenals because there's incentives to keep them isolated within these states to keep them to themselves. And if we were to work towards a global zero, this would require states to move all these nuclear weapons um, out to like a international weapons bank where we would know that weapons are being destroyed and that inevitably creates situations where people can steal these. Once they're out of these secured arsenals, it's more likely that they'll be stolen. Uh, and of course, this, uh, as some authors like Kenneth Walsh will say, that most of these technologies or most of these weapons can easily fit in a van. So it's, it's, it's problematic to move these from safe arsenals to you know, places overseas that pose great threats. So for these reasons, we see that it's actually undesirable to have a world without nuclear weapons. All right, thank you to our panelists. Um, at this point, I would like to invite Dr. Klajero, our guest, um, to speak for about 10 minutes um, and share your thoughts with us, maybe respond to some of the panelists. So whenever yes, you're ready. Yes, yes. <coughs> well, first of all, I want to congratulate all four because I must say that I've heard the very good cases, pro and against, very, very well put, and uh, I almost was convinced <laughs> by each one of them, <laughs> including the, la the last one. Um, but maybe you will not be surprised if I tend to counter <laughs> the last arguments more than, than um, the first arguments. The, the, there are two issues that were treated uh, separately, the, the issue of the, the desirability and the issue of the feasibility. And uh, I'll, I'll start from the desirability because I think it is the main issue in the sense that uh, once it were recognized universally that it is desirable, it uh, then would be easy to go, then we can discuss the, the feasibility from the technical point of view. But the desirability has to be decide, defined in terms of alternatives. And the argument that uh, a situation in which some states have nuclear weapons and it is a stable situation is a, a strong argument. In fact, one can argue that uh, the world we have has been a world in which nuclear weapons have not been used for 70 years, and this is, is good. Uh, one counter argument to that is actually to look at how this has happened. In other words, has this really been stable or have we been close to disasters more than once? And that is a serious argument and one must remember that the people who were in charge have said that we have survived more by luck than by design. In other words, there have been many cases in which the world has been on the verge of a terrible catastrophe. Uh, a, a nuclear war started by, starting by a mistake, or, uh, and, and that would have been uh, the end of the world. Just to quote one particularly famous case, during the missile crisis, the Cuban missile crisis, the United States were not aware that nuclear weapons were already present in Cuba. And the possibility of an 
invasion of Cuba to prevent uh, the arrival of the nuclear weapons, the missiles that were arriving, was taken very, very seriously, discussed. And on this basis of not knowing that if this were to be decided, the nuclear weapons that were already there, the tactical nuclear weapons, would have been used. They, uh, the local commanders had the authority to do that. And that would have started a nuclear war. So it's, it's one example where the world went very close to such a disaster. Of course, it's a strong argument to say, yes, but it never happened that nuclear weapons were used. True, but if you have a situation in which, you know, one time it goes bad, it's, it's a, an unimaginable catastrophe, it, it's a serious argument. That is one with respect to, so to say, in maintenance of the present stable situation. But the present situation is not really stable. The situation in which you have five countries which are officially recognized as having nuclear weapons and then three more is temporary and it is not sustainable in the long run. So the real alternative that has to be faced is Either a, a, a world so arranged, I mean, either a world in, in which the direction of motion is to eliminate nuclear weapons, beginning from eliminating more and more the circumstances in which the, the, their use is envisaged, or a world in which nuclear weapons will spread. Because it is, uh, you have to think of why the vast majorities of countries in the world have renounced voluntarily nuclear weapons. And uh, how this is sustainable politically, it is not sustainable. In, in more and more countries, dissatisfaction with the present situation is growing. The, the non-proliferation treaty was to some extent based on a bargain, the nuclear weapon the, the non-nuclear weapon countries that accepted to renounce nuclear weapons uh, were expecting in exchange that the nuclear weapon countries make progress towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. The goal was to arrive at the, at the world of, without nuclear weapons. And unless some movement in this direction is sustained, this situation is not going to last. Fortunately, the end of the Cold War has made such a progress possible, and in, indeed there has been some progress in this direction, and this is what has to be continued in terms of desirability. The feasibility is instead, I think, a, a, a much more clear situation, because we, we have examples. We have a treaty that has banned chemical weapons. And uh, that treaty, uh, banning chemical weapons is uh, much more difficult because if you ban the weapons, you must have a verification system that verifies in a credible manner that nobody's cheating. And that entails a, some sort of supervision of the entire chemical industry of the world, which is a much more difficult task than supervising the peaceful energies activities of the old world because of the very different scale of, the, of these two types of activities. And a, a, a chemical weapon convention has been agreed after much discussion. It is working. It, is, it has demonstrated its usefulness recently because one of the very few countries that were still out, Syria, has in fact found in, this, in the existence of this system the, the correct way to uh, eliminate their own nuclear weapons and to solve that aspect of the conflict. So uh, the, the feasibility, I would say, is demonstrably uh, not, not, not a problem. It is not a problem because fortunately there is a sufficient difference between peaceful nuclear activities and military nuclear activities. And so it is possible to design a system which is now in existence because the, all the countries that have accepted to be non-nuclear weapon countries have also accepted the verification by the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, that verifies 
their, their uh, peaceful nuclear activities. So it is a system that uh, can work, that does work, and uh, does guarantee the, the, the feasibility of, uh, of this system. How, may, how am I doing with time? Pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, maybe I, I shouldn't say uh, much more. Uh, one, one thing maybe I, I should say in addition, the uh, theory surrounding the existence of nuclear weapons and, and their usefulness without being used is based on uh, the notion of deterrence. But uh, the notion of deterrence, uh, first of all, it is uh, a notion that exists in the minds of people and in the writings of the experts on this matter. It is not something that can be so clearly demonstrated. For instance, the fact that uh, there, wa that there was not an, an attack by the Soviet Union in Europe it is ascribed to the fact that there were nuclear weapons on, on, on our side. But it, it is not, it's not proven, it's not provable. It is not uh, clear that there was a real intention of starting uh, su such a war. But in addition, uh, the question is, what is the goal of nuclear weapon deterrence? And if this goal is limited to deterring an attack with nuclear weapons, then of course the uh, reasonable situation is that, that uh, if nuclear weapons can be eliminated altogether in a very final manner, then you don't need deterrence. If instead the goal of deterrence is are other goals, broader goals, to eliminate an attack with conventional forces, then of course it, it is uh, much more difficult to eliminate them. So that is the transition that has to occur, the transition to recognizing that the goal of nuclear weapons is only to deter an attack with nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calagero. Um, with that, I would like to open up the panel for discussion. I would strongly encourage you to ask questions, uh, give us a prompt to work with, and we will answer those and get on with the panel. This microphone is for whoever wants to speak. <laughs> All right, so um, I know in your argument, Polly, you noted that North Korea was unreasonable, and Dr. Collagero kind of stated that the desirability is more important than the feasibility, which I agree with. And if North Korea is so unreasonable, how, how do we convince them to disarm their nuclear weapons if they're being so unreasonable? Can you reason with a country like that? And if so, how would you do it? Are you, are you asking me because I'm not exactly an expert on, on that, but would you like to answer it or, or should I? I mean, I can try, but. Try. <laughs> how, how do we reason with an unreasonable uh, actor? And you're talking about if we were trying to pursue this nuclear free world, how would we get them to disarm? Is that, is that what you're, you're saying? Um, from what I've heard, I think that China would have to be the major player in that sense, which is difficult in and of itself. China has obviously, it, it supports North Korea's entire economy. I mean, they greatly rely on it. So if, if, um, if anyone had any, they literally would have political pull in North Korea, so if anyone was going to be able to convince them that this was in their best interest, it would, I would say it would come from China. Uh, yes, I, I, <coughs> I, I fully agree. The question of the transitions to a nuclear weapon free world is of course a process that cannot happen in, 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 a, in, a, in a very, very quickly. And the main issue in this respect is first of all the relationship between the United States and uh, Russia one must realize that even now, after the substantial reductions in the arsenals of the United States and Russia, nevertheless, even now, 95% of the existing nuclear weapons belong to these two countries. So it is, of course, primarily 
the, the process has to begin in the relationship between the United States and, and Russia. In the final stages, one can imagine some uh, state, a, a rogue state, as has been mentioned, the typical example is indeed uh, North Korea, which is uh, a, a kind of a, a, an aberration of, of a state. I mean, uh, how to deal with that then when it will come to the moment one will have to face it, when the whole world were to be united in going in the direction of the elimination of nuclear weapons, it would not be tolerable that uh, you know, a single small state can stop that process. But aside from that, I fully agree with what um, Paola said, that uh, the main responsibility to deal with the, with the present problem of North Korea is with China. And I think that this is beginning to be more and more understood by China that is taking more and more of a proactive attitude in this negotiation that is taking place. And um, so I, I think that the problem of North Korea might in fact be solvable even earlier than the, the final moment of uh, arriving to the elimination of all nuclear weapons. And um, the, the negotiation is on. The role of China is crucial. This is kind of a question for the pro-nuclear-free world side in general. Um, throughout history, we've kind of seen the, the pattern of when great powers, when their spheres of influence come into contact with each other, that conflict inevitably results. We've seen this with Persia and Greece, Athens and Sparta, Rome and Carthage, Germany and France. And then the only real example of that not happening is with the Soviet Union and the United States from 1945 to 1991. And people made the argument that that was because of nuclear weapons. Aren't you concerned that if we create this nuclear free world that those kind of conflicts would return and that war would become even more likely? Well, it's to our whole side, if, you, if you'd like to. I can't. Yes, I, I will just say that in, in this respect, I'm, I'm very optimistic because I think that the end of the Cold War was a great uh, revolution. Um, the, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States are, were based on totally different and opposing ideologies. Now, if you look at the United States and uh, Russia, there is no more an ideological difference. Both these countries believe in uh, market economy, both, in some sense, believe in democracy, which may be more or less working. You may have democracy with elections when then there is some cheating, uh, which is not uh, perfect. But this is the paradigm now. It's not a one-party system. It's not uh, a, a, the communist in the usual sense. In addition, these two major countries, and this is also true for China, have a common enemy. And the common enemy is terrorism, or you might say destabilization. They have become status quo countries. They want uh, stability, they want, uh, or I might say you want, or I might say we want, a, a stable world uh, in which uh, there are no major conflicts. So there are common interests, and, and therefore it is only natural that eventually this will result in trying to have a, a, a setup which is stable, and it is very clear that only a world without nuclear weapons can be such a setup, because a, a fragmented world in nation states with the possibility of nation states acquiring nuclear weapons is, is unstable, evidently. Any other questions? Hello. This is kind of jumping off of the North Korea question. Uh, it seems like these countries, North Korea and Iran, these rogue states specifically, but this also, I think, continues to um, terrorist cells. Nuclear weapons give these groups international legitimacy, it seems, that they wouldn't necessarily have because we fear nuclear weapons to the point we have. How, how is, like, as a, in the globe, how can we deal with this this legitimacy through nuclear fear, essentially. How about we split this one up? Um, let's have Os or Emma and Taylor answer first, and then we can move on down the panel, get both sides. 
Um, well, I don't think there's a lot you can do with like the legitimacy of going nuclear. I mean, obviously states want to have that capacity and they want to be in the nuclear club, but um, I'm not really sure how you want us to approach this question, like how do we resolve that issue? Um, I mean, obviously we don't want to get in their hands and I think that like removing nuclear weapons only increases the chances of that happening. So I think that that's an inevitable uh, association that if you're to go nuclear, then you'll become a legitimate power. And I think that that's you know, one of the predominant reasons outside of the security uh, that's gained from nuclear weapons. Um, I don't really know what else to go with that. I mean, I guess I just want to add, like I think a component of our globalized world is that anyone can be a threat. Um, and with the preponderance of intelligence and resources, anyone can have, essentially anyone can have these capabilities. Uh, so I don't think it's a matter of addressing the legitimacy as being a bad thing. I think it's just a component of globalization and something we need to understand as we're re-understanding our security paradigm. Um. As far as m nuclear weapons making a state more legitimate, um, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily see North Korea as being more legitimate because of that, as their, I guess their abilities haven't proven to be too damaging all around, and a lot of these are just empty threats that we've seen uh, time and time again. But I think uh, in some sense it does put more pressure on us to, to address their actual issues and their concerns, uh, the problems that we need to deal with North Korea, like why are they doing this, or the problems with Iran, why are they per, or, uh, building up their nuclear capabilities, so. And my, my response would, to that would be, I think that we, it didn't really legitimize the threat of terrorism or even of North Korea. I think that before, obviously no terrorist cell has obtained a nuclear weapon yet, but I think we, we already see them as a legitimate threat. They've already been legitimized in that sense, is that they've obviously already received an international attention and worry and have destabilized many um, situations. So we already see them as a legitimate threat and adding nuclear weapons to um, that equation only makes it exponentially more dangerous and unacceptable, but I think that the legitimacy is already there, and maybe their goal for um, obtaining nuclear weapons is to seek legitimacy in some way, but I think that we've already uh, envisioned them that as a, major, as a major threat as it is. I, I think you could uh, look at the example of South Africa. South Africa was a pariah state in the sense that the type of uh, internal setup with uh, explicit uh, racism being uh, the, the foundation of the state had become uh, unacceptable in, in, in the world. And uh, to some extent, they tried to maintain that system, the, the, the white minority, and they even uh, acquired uh, a nuclear weapon capability to sustain this system. But at some point, it just became unsustainable. And then uh, there was the, the great uh, transition that has occurred, including the elimination of nuclear weapons. So this is an example of uh, the fact that uh, a state which feels uh, completely alienated from the rest of the world can go in the direction of acquiring nuclear weapons, but eventually this becomes uh, unsustainable and uh, not necessarily with the military intervention from outside, but in fact from really a, a very strong system of uh, sanctions and of uh, uh, severing relations. It worked in the case of South Africa. There are many other examples of countries that have uh, given up a nuclear weapon capability. It, you didn't mention the three other states. When the Soviet Union broke up, three of the states created, great states, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, found on their territory and in their hands, I mean, in, in their possession, arsenals of nuclear weapons, which were enormous. The arsenal in Ukraine and Kazakhstan in each of these countries was larger than the combined arsenals of Great Britain, France, and China. 
at the time. Nevertheless, they decided to give, to give this up because to become a member of the International Security Society at that time uh, was, was the way to go. And, and so it, it is possible that such a choice becomes the reasonable and accepted choice. Hi. First of all, I want to say I want to thank the panel. This is probably the best panel I've attended in a long time. I want to thank Professor Caledro for responding. I want to uh, thank the panelists for the excellent arguments. I was bought by both sides, <laughs> um, and uh, I want to thank Professor uh, Rebecca Moore for putting it together. My question is. Um, China is forecast to uh, surpass the U.S. as the lead economy by 2050. Um, what would a China-dominated world look like with respect to a nuclear-free world? Um, how likely is China to endorse such an international regime? If you could comment on that. I'll go with that one. Um, I don't see China being willing to give up, give up their second strike capabilities. I don't think uh, they're in a place where they even want to get close to that. Um, and I think that if they sign on to treaties indicating that they would like to participate in arms reduction, it will hit that second strike wall. Um, but I also believe that the economic interdependence between the United States and China is going to keep things stable. Uh, so I think that that's going to be a ruling force where even in a nuclear world, we're going to have stability coming from another area. And I'll add to that by saying I agree with the fact that ec economic interdependence is only going to be greater at that point um, when China does um, become the dominant economic power in the world. And I, I would say that that interdependence will even spur them to rethink their, their whole attitude about nuclear, a nuclear weapons-free world, especially considering North Korea. I think that just the fact that we would be so intertwined in that uh, China's economy, I mean, they obviously have great interest in preserving, preserving it, and um, the economic uh, implications of an actual nuclear strike, I don't think that, that anyone at that point will be willing to accept that that is a possibility, and, and especially with the rogue states, or if, if uh, nuclear weapons had been further proliferated by that time, I, I think that it would, it would only reinforce um, the desire for a nuclear weapons-free world. Well, I, I think you have to <laughs> think about the fact that a nuclear weapon-free world will not be very different from the present world. The present world is a world in which nuclear weapons have never been used after 1945. How many of you were alive in 1945? <laughs> so, as, as, as far as you know, your life, nuclear weapons existed. They, in some cases, uh, there have been accidents. In some cases, it has been very close to their being used and a catastrophe occurring, but de facto, they have never been used, and they have played no real military role in the sense in which you know, weapons are used by military, not only in terms of the theories of people who write about these matters, but in the field. Nuclear weapons have never been used. And there have been situations in which countries possessing enormous arsenals have been defeated by countries that had no nuclear weapons. It's you know, unpleasant to remind you of that, but Vietnam was a situation in which the United States were defeated by Vietnam and preferred not to use nuclear weapons nevertheless. They could have obliterated Vietnam, but fortunately this didn't happen. The same happened to the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They could have obliterated Afghanistan. They, in fact, were defeated and had to withdraw. So these weapons are demonstrably, to a very large extent, unusable. And that means that a world without nuclear weapons, which is, of course, desirable because they represent a danger, will not be very different from the present world. Because in the present world, nuclear weapons play no role. Just one last example I'll give you. You know, in Europe, there are uh, disagreements on agricultural policy, on the euro, and so on. But 
in Europe, there are two countries that possess nuclear weapons, uh, France and Great Britain, and Germany, Italy, Spain don't. But in these discussions, on this disagreement, if, uh, say, France should say, okay, you have to do as I say because we have nuclear weapons, the others would simply laugh. They would say, no, but we won the last the football championship. Because, I mean, it, it is really inconceivable that the, the, the foreign minister of France could put on the table the fact that they have nuclear weapons. So having nuclear weapons is, uh, is just uh, irrelevant. And uh, that means that going towards their elimination is not as impossible or as dramatic as a greater change as one might think. All right, well, at this point, we have time for one more question. So if anyone has something they'd like to wrap up, I see one up here. Hi. Uh, well, you guys mentioned a couple times about North Korea and Iran as a threat. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, what are the evidence that Iran actually has nuclear weapon, if there is any? Thank you. Iran has no nuclear weapons. I think the evidence that Iran has uh, no nuclear weapons, this is, I think, a universal uh, agreement and understanding. The question is whether Iran might acquire a capability to eventually start a nuclear weapon program. This has to do with the fact that the most important component technologically, the, the, the main difficulty to acquire a nuclear arsenal is to have the materials, in, in this case, highly enriched uranium. But enriching uranium is also useful for peaceful nuclear activities, and the argument of Iran is that they want to retain this capability because it is a, a, a right. In fact, it is enshrined by the Non-Proliferation Treaty that the countries that renounce, renounce nuclear weapons should be not only permitted, but even helped in developing peaceful nuclear activity. So that, that is the argument. That doesn't uh, exclude that there are some people in Iran that want to acquire this capability because they envisage eventually acquiring nuclear weapons. Or, but uh, at present, <laughs> there is no nuclear uh, weapon program in Iran. I think this is a universally accepted uh, judgment. The issue is about the uranium enri enrichment as a way to make an eventual decision to acquire nuclear weapon easier in, in the future. Oops. And then I think uh, one of the bigger issues the United States had with uh, believing Iran was going after the nuclear weapon was uh, former President Ahmadinejad uh, and his you know, pretty outspoken statements about wanting a nuclear weapon. But since, uh, since he has left office and new President Rouhani has taken over, uh, he has stated that Iran has no intentions of going after the nuclear weapon and that it does not even fit the religious ideals or the ethics of Iran itself. So I, I believe uh, Kalajiro is right in thinking that you know, they are just going after a, a nuclear energy source. I, yeah, I guess I can I can jump in and say that um, basically, yeah, there's there's just great insecurity in that sense in in Iran and in the Middle East right right now concerning nuclear weapons. I just read an article and I don't even remember where, but uh, it, it stated that Saudi Arabia has definitely have they have actually or, already purchased the ability to acquire nuclear weapons from Pakistan if Iran actually does. Um, uh, seek nuclear armament. So I, I just feel as though the main issue in that in that whole area with Iran obtaining nuclear weapons is is the fact that it would immediately cause a definite reaction um, in in it, in the area in the Middle East. With that, I'd like to thank you all for coming out this morning. I know many of you have class to get you, and please join me in thanking our panelists and Dr. Kalajero. Thank you.